Hello YouTube, welcome back to my Witcher Law series and Season of Storms. When Geralt arrived at Pine Copse, he immediately saw several dead bodies, massacred beyond recognition, including a child. A boy, perhaps five years old, was torn in halves. Someone, or rather something, had grabbed him by both legs and torn him asunder. One body had a ripped belly and the intestines had been pulled out to their full length. The intestines ran in a straight pale blue-pink line towards a shack made from pine branches. Inside lay a lean man, Sorrel Degalund. He had been present during the audience with Othalan. The Witcher contemplated to kill the Energyman while he was still unconscious. But before he could come to a decision, Sorrel Degalund returned to consciousness. When he saw what he was holding, he began to scream. Geralt regretted not surprising the visit before the demon had abandoned him. He knew how dangerous a confrontation with the demon could be, and that he should be glad that he had avoided it. But he wasn't. Because now he didn't know what to do. Why me, he thought. Why not Franz Torquil with his unit? The constable would not have any doubts nor scruples. Degalon begged Geralt not to kill him. The Witcher just told him to shut up and asked him if he was conscious enough to use magic and Degalon said that he had a sigil and could teleport them to Risberg. As the wizard prepared for the teleportation, Geralt noticed a change in his demeanor. Too late. Degalon had tricked him and before Geralt could react, he felt the cold darkness of the teleport. They ended up at Degalon's secret retreat, a place in which he performed his experiments along with his master experiments that were not known at Risberg. Geralt was still numb from the teleport and was held in check by a hunchback with a nasty looking crossbow. The fake fear and play panic had vanished. Sorrel Degalon grinned with a malicious sneer, full of pride and arrogance. The sorcerer injected him with something and Geralt instantly felt burning pain. The pain was so awful that he was barely able to stop himself from screaming. He was dragged and brutally seated in an armchair with a high support. Those that had dragged him there resembled the huge ogre dwarf Mikita, Pyral Pratt's bodyguard. Degalon told Geralt that he had treated him with the venom of a white scorpion and totally paralyzed him. If he did not receive an antidote, he would eventually suffocate. White scorpion venom was deadly. Geralt had never before come in contact with it and he didn't know what the reaction of a witcher's organism to it would be. Meanwhile, Zorel Degalund explained that a few years ago he had become the assistant to Ortolan. He was to, just like his predecessors, spy on Ortolan and sabotage his more threatening ideas. He owed this position not only to his talent, but also his beauty and personal charm. In the time of Ortolan's youth, misogyny had been common among wizards, and there was a fashion for manly friendships, which often changed into something more, sometimes much more. Degalund liked women, but in principle had nothing against the little pederasty, as long as it furthered his career. He had made an effort to make people think that Ortolan had fallen for him and would do anything for his lover, that he had access to his books and secret notes, and that he taught him forbidden spells, including Goetia. Degalund, having no success, had to create the appearance of such. He had to make Risberg believe that he could indeed summon demons. It was known that a demon summoned by a goat often freed itself and spread destruction. So he spread. He slaughtered a few villagers and they believed that it was a demon. It had mostly been the half-breed ogres that did the slaughtering, but he had also contributed. Geralt grew more optimistic. His sight was improving fast, his shivering was ceasing. He was immune to most known toxins, while Scorpion's venom, which was deadly to most normal people, luckily turned out not to be an exception. The symptoms, which at the beginning had been quite severe, subsided and vanished as time passed. As it turned out, a witcher's organism was also able to neutralize the toxin quite fast. Risberg had decided that they needed to stop Degalund. But how? They still believed in his power as a goat and were afraid of his demons. And they were afraid to anger Ortolan, who was in love with him. The solution had been Geralt, a witcher. So Degalund had run to Ortolan. The Archmaster had scorned him at first, it was not nice to kill lumberjacks, but then he had told him how to deceive and trap the Witcher. He forbade however to kill him, 
he needed Geralt's eyes. To be more precise, he needed the layer of tissue on the inside of his eyeballs which let him see in the darkness. The newest of Ortolan's ideas was equipping all of humanity with cat sight. That tissue had to come from a live donor. Ortolan, an ethical and merciful mage, after removing his eyeballs, planned to let Geralt live. He thought that it was better to be blind than dead, and he was unwilling to cause pain to Yennefer of Vengeborg, whom he liked. However, the thought of bringing her pain caused Degelund, unlike his master, immeasurable joy. He would cut off that piece that she prized the most in Geralt and send it to her in Vengeborg. While he was rambling on, Geralt managed to cast a sign and incapacitate the wizard. He grabbed his sword and put the blade on Degelund's throat. He told the wizard to teleport them out of there as the hunchback and the ogre dwarves rushed to their master's aid. There was a cold darkness and then he found himself alone, on the ground, in a forest, at night. He woke at dawn on red grass in a bush near a swamp or lake. The night before, he had drunk a witcher's elixir called Golden Oriole, which was particularly efficient in fighting all kinds of poisons, infections and the effects of many toxins and venoms. Geralt had saved himself with Golden Oriole more times than he could remember, but he had never had effects like this. For a full hour after ingesting the elixir, he had fought with cramps and a strong gag reflex, fully aware that he couldn't let himself vomit. He had fallen into a deep sleep from exhaustion. As to the journey, he was not sure what had happened. How and why the portal opened by Daelund had thrown him here, in a swampy wasteland. He doubted that it had been intended by the wizard. A simple teleport malfunction was more probable. Something that he had been afraid would happen for over a week now. First he had lost his swords, barely three weeks had passed and now he had also lost his mount. Roach was left at Pine Cups. Unless she was found and appropriated by someone, she was going to get eaten by wolves. Swords, horse, what now? It was scary to even think about it. After an hour's journey he made it into drier lands, and after another hour he arrived at a beaten road. After half an hour on the road, he came to a crossroads, with a signpost. All of the boards were covered with bird shit and full of holes left by bolts. Despite this, Geralt could decipher the directions and knew roughly where he was. The teleport had thrown him out in between two rivers, or rather two branches of the Ponta River. The southern branch, because of its size, had even been given a name. It was listed on many maps as Embla, and the country lying between the branches had once been named Emblonia. The kingdom of Emblonia had ceased to exist about half a century ago. It had fallen into decline and eventually vanished. Its powerful neighbors, Temeria and Redania, had made sure that happened. Amblonia lay in the valley of the Pontar, which deposited silt carried by floods for centuries. That meant extraordinarily fertile and agriculturally efficient soil. Temeria and Redania had experienced a significant increase in population, and agriculture had become vital. The two kingdoms divided Amblonia between them and erased its name from the maps. The part annexed by Temeria was called Pontaria, and the one that came to Redania was called Riverside. Soon conflicts arose. The treaty defining the border between Temeria and Redania included certain points that could be interpreted in different ways, and the maps attached to the treaty were useless as the cartographers had botched a job. Furthermore, the river itself added to the problem. After long periods of rain, it could shift its bed for two or three miles away. Border conflicts had grown in force, bloodshed seemed unavoidable. And finally it came to that, and then it came to bloodshed regularly. Geralt usually avoided territories with frequent armed conflicts. It was hard to find jobs in such places. Once farmers got to know regular soldiers, mercenary and marauders once or twice, they were convinced that the werewolves roaming the region, striggers, trolls under the bridge or barrow whites were a relatively small problem in comparison. For this reason Geralt barely knew Emblonia. In particular, he had not a clue as to which of the indicated places was nearest. Carol chose Findetan, which was to the north. In this general direction was Novigrad where he had to go, if he was to recover his swords before the 15th of July. After an hour of brisk march, he ran straight into what he had hoped to avoid. 
Three armed soldiers were trying to press taxes out of a family of farmers after yet another border shift. Geralt intervened, grabbing the nearest soldier who was hitting a farmer with a whip by the arm and twisted it. The soldier howled and Geralt told all of them to go away. Instead of complying, they signaled their companions and nine other soldiers appeared, mounted and armed. One of them put a knife to the farmer's neck, the other caught the woman by the hair, and a third called the child. Geralt dropped his sword. One of the men recognized him as a witcher and picked it up. He told his companions about the legendary quality of a witcher sword, that such weapons could cut through anything. One of the men very much doubted this and ordered his comrade to bind blades with him. The swords collided with a crash. The shattering metal of Geralt's sword moaned pitifully. The blade had broken off a few inches from the golden-plated crossguard. When the soldiers saw this, they called Geralt a fraud and a cheat. They rode off, dragging him behind a horse, bound to the saddle with a leather strap. Along the way, on the slope of a ravine, something suddenly flashed, ignited and became a milky opalescent sphere. The sphere vanished and in its place appeared a weird group, a lean, long-haired and slightly effeminate man, two long-armed giants on bandy legs and a hunchback midget with a huge crossbow with two steel prods. Degelund and company. Geralt was not inclined to wait for the result of the ensuing battle. He arranged his fingers into the Igni sign and burned through the leather strap binding his hands. He threw one of the soldiers from the saddle, mounted the horse and fled in a gallop. He heard the shriek of one of the soldiers like the sound of a slaughtered rooster for a long time, until he turned from the road and entered the forest. Geralt arrived at a post station at the crossroads of two highways. The dwarf sat inside, behind a table in the corner. When Geralt entered, the dwarf invited him over to join him at his table for a meal and introduced himself as Adario Bach. He had come from Sedaris by courier's coach and was now waiting for a coach from Dorian to Redania to Tredegor. They ate their potato soup while Adario explained that the best potato soup in the world was prepared by the Dwarven women in Mahakam. As they finished their meal, two horses appeared in front of the station and soon after three of the soldiers Geralt had encountered entered the station. When they recognized Geralt, they started a fight. But Geralt quickly grabbed a broom and took care of them, beating them up a bit and throwing their swords into the wooden ceiling. Soon after, several more soldiers marched into the station. This time, men of King Foltest, Lord of Temeria, Pontaria and Mahakam, in pursuit of the Redanian band. When they asked about the beaten up soldiers now sitting quietly in a corner, the dwarf gave them an alibi, claiming they were his servants and the female leader of the band was a whore he had bought to fuck along his journey. Satisfied, the Temerian soldiers left. The dwarf made it clear that he didn't like the Redanian band, but he liked seeing hangings even less, and Geralt advised them to leave as quickly as possible. When Geralt finally decided to continue on his way, the dwarf followed him along, unwilling to wait two more days for the coach and worried that the leader of the band had not appreciated being called a whore and slapped on her ass in front of the Temerians. Geralt welcomed the company. It was now the 9th of July and Geralt had to get to Novigrad before the 15th, so they marched briskly. Maybe even too much so. Dwarves decidedly preferred marching. They were unbested walkers. A dwarf could walk 30 miles in a day, a distance traveled by a man on horse, and that carrying a load that a human wouldn't be able to lift. It was beyond human abilities to keep up in a march with a dwarf without any load. That included witchers. Geralt had forgotten about that, and after some time he was forced to ask Adario to slow down. Their goal was the village of Windley, on the shore of the Pontar. Barges and boats moored there frequently, and if they were lucky, they would find a vessel there. The dwarf planned to get off at Crane Islet, and after three or four days, the boat would arrive in Novigrad. A 
Arriving at Windley, they were in luck. There was indeed a boat waiting there, a sloop called Prophet Libioda. Its owner, Cavernard von Fleet, introduced himself. When Geralt asked the businessman what he was doing in such a forsaken wasteland, he first evaded, then hinted at it being some kind of a rescue expedition. When one of the boat owner's men recognized Geralt from his white hair, Van Fleet got excited, claiming that a witcher was exactly what they needed. The man introduced himself as Yavo Fish, shareholder of an enterprise in Novigrad, his partner Peter Cobbin, and Boxcray, the captain of the Prophet Libioda. They offered Geralt a contract, guarding the boat, and in return giving him and the Dwarven Dario a free ride to Novigrad. The details were to be discussed aboard. Suspicious, but out of alternatives, Geralt agreed. After the Prophet Libioda set sails, the boat owner von Fleet kept his promise and began to explain their situation. The expedition had the goal of rescuing a child, the only daughter of Brianna de Sepulveda, business owner from Novigrad. A monster had taken the girl, a vulpes, or aguara, a she-fox. When Geralt doubted his words, since aguaras only took elven children, Van Fleet confirmed that although unusual for a Novigrad business owner, Brianna was indeed a pure-blooded elf. But Geralt remained skeptical. He knew that elves, when their children were kidnapped by a vixen, never tried to get them back. The group admitted that the elf had not asked them for help. Despite this, the Merchant's Guild had raised funds to pay for the expedition. Carol told them that unfortunately the rescue expedition was futile and already doomed to fail. The child that was kidnapped by the Aguara was beyond recovery, and the problem was not even finding the girl, or because the Aguara would not give up the child willingly. The fact of the matter was, the kidnapped child had ceased to be a child. A change occurred in kidnapped girls. They transformed and became Aguaras themselves. Aguaras didn't breed. They continued their kind by kidnapping and transforming elven children. The only way to defend from an Aguara was to keep far from it. Annoyed by the Witcher's negativity, the men admitted that in fact they had already found a girl, and that she was under guard below deck. Or rather, not exactly Brianna's daughter. It had turned out to be another child that had been kidnapped by the Aguara. Soldiers had stolen the girl from the Aguara with a trick. Although it was not the proper one, they had taken her anyway. Why should Elven Spawn grow up to be something even worse? And in Novigrad they could sell her to an exotic game collector. She was an oddity after all, half a vixen, raised by an Aguara in the middle of the forest, a menagerie would surely pay well. The Witcher told them to immediately head for the shore. If they didn't free the girl at once, they were all doomed. When Geralt headed for the lower deck, the men tried to stop him, but Adario Bach intervened and helped Geralt to keep the men in check. The Witcher descended the steps leading under the deck, pulled open one door, then another, and froze. Behind him, Adario Bach swore. Van Fleet moaned. Lying on a bed was a lean girl with glassy eyes. She was half naked from waist down completely naked, with her legs obscenely spread. And her neck was twisted in a very unnatural way, and still more obscene. Parlagi, the man that had been sent below deck to guard the girl, was now leaning over her and reeked of alcohol. Geralt made the situation very clear. If they had let the young cub loose and left her on the shore, there was a slim chance that the Aguara would have left them be. But after what had happened, their only hope was escape. It was already a miracle that the Aguara had not gotten them earlier. He told the captain to set all sails, every single one he had. As they sailed at high speeds down the river, Adario approached Geralt curiously. He asked the Witcher whether the Aguara, since she could show up like a woman, but also take the form of a vixen, was like a werewolf. Geralt told him that it was different. Werewolves, werebears, were-rats, and so on, were therianthropes, humans able to transform into animals. Aguaras were anterions, beasts or beings able to take the form of a human. There were also many unbelievable stories about their powers. Geralt hoped to get to Novigrad before the Aguara could show them what she was capable of. A moment later, the sky grew dark and a wind broke. The storm caused the Prophet Libioda to rock and dance on the waves, every now and then getting significantly slanted. It was hard to tell how long this carried on. Finally, the wind ceased tugging, and the thunderstorm rocking the water ceased, at first changing into rain, and then into a light drizzle. The captain's maneuvers had worked. They had managed to hide behind a forest-covered isle. 
Mist rose from the waters. The captain leaned over the compass and judged the currents. When he looked up, he could have sworn there had been two forks in the river, but now only one could be seen. The current was still leading them, but the compass had also shown strange readings. When Boxgrey asked Geralt to take a look, they both froze. Over the water hung a huge, partially uprooted tree. On one of the branches stood a woman, in a long, tight dress. She stood there motionlessly staring at them. The Aguara had found them. They had sailed into the Pontar's bogs. The swamp was uncharted. There was no wind. They were adrift. The men discussed the possibility of putting Parlegi, the man that had killed the girl, in a dinghy with the corpse and set them adrift. But Van Fleet forbade it. On his ship, nobody was going to be sentenced to death by monster. A moment later, everyone was shouting, looking at a rotten shipwreck overgrown with vines and mud. The same one they had seen an hour ago. They were sailing in circles. Geralt indicated a river branch with a maelstrom and boiling water. That was the only way out. And likely, the maelstrom was yet another of the Vixen's illusions. They had no choice, Boxcray agreed. The funnel was boiling, seething, the foam swelled and frothed. The prophet shook and jerked. The whirlpool sucked at it. The sloop began to sway and rotate faster and faster. Everyone shouted. Then all of a sudden, all was quiet. The water calmed and became smooth like glass. The prophet Libioda gradually drifted among the overgrown marshy shore. It had indeed been an illusion. This time they heard her before they saw her. A loud, sharp bark, like a yell, threat or warning. She appeared on the shore in the disguise of a fox on the trunk of a fallen tree. The water under the tree suddenly started bubbling and from it emerged a monster, huge all covered with green and brown patterns of its scales. The monster, following the commands of the fox, swam through the water, right towards the prophet. The vixen had caught a larger Voidianoi in her spell. The monster gnawed and tore at the rudder, ignoring the shouts and boathook blows. Then the rudder cracked, and the creature had a piece of board in its teeth. Whether it had decided that this was enough, or the spell of the fox had lost its strength, it dived and disappeared. The sloop floated under the overhanging branches and buried itself into the trunks of a fallen tree. The fox took advantage of this. She jumped onto the nose of the craft, quickly and quietly. Before them she changed, growing into a tall woman with a fox head, with pointy ears and an elongated muzzle. On fleet was crying, Gobin and the soldiers were pale and crowded around Boxcray. Boxcray took off his cap. They had done wrong, Geralt told her. The men had behaved badly, but he could not let her butcher them. The fox stood up, taking the girl. She looked around at everyone. Then she looked directly at Geralt. You stood against me, she said in a barking voice, in their defense. He did not answer. Holding her daughter in her arms was more important than their lives, the Aguara told him. But he had stood in their defense. For that, she would come for him. Later. One day, when he had forgotten, when he would no longer expect it. She jumped quickly to the gunnel and from there to a fallen tree, and disappeared into the undergrowth. There was a cry from the lookout. Beyond the reeds appeared thatched roofed houses, a yellow sand beach, a pier, and then, behind the trees of the headland, the wide blue sky over a river. Everyone yelled, the sailors, Peter Cobbin and Van Fleet. Only Gerald and Adario Bach did not join in the chorus. Boxgrey was also silent, holding the wheel. The boat didn't listen to a broken rudder and the current grew stronger. They would drift on where it carried them, back into the offshoot, back into the swamp. Cobbin cursed and jumped overboard. He swam to the shore, following him went all the sailors jumping to the water. Gerald could not stop anyone. Adario Bach kept a tight grip on Van Vliet. It had been the Aguaro's farewell illusion. Those in the water suddenly began to cry out and thrash in the water. One by one, they disappeared below. Adario Bach jumped into the dinghy, 
followed by Geralt and the still petrified von Fleet. Boxgrey, however, just waved his cap. He was not going to abandon his ship. The prophet Libyoda drifted quietly and majestically, entering the duct and disappeared. Adario rode. They'd row to the fairway, hail a ship, and if that didn't work, they'd row all the way to Novigrad. And with that, we're at the end of part 3 of Season of Storms. As always, a few more bits of information and trivia. While Degalund revealed his evil deed to Geralt, he mentioned the works of Alzur and Iroran again. Malaspina, Alzur and Iroran had worked on turning normal creatures into giants. That had resulted in beasts like the giant centipedes and spiders, or even Koshchis, who you should remember, since one of these shows up in Witcher 1. According to Degalund, they had also worked on doing things to humans, turning them into titans, strong, able to work 20 hours a day, immune to illness, living in full health to 100 years old. We can assume that these experiments, while not entirely successful, eventually led to the development of the Witcher mutations. When Geralt is recognized by the soldiers at the farm in Emblonia, one of the men didn't think highly of Witchers. He had witnessed a few Cat Witchers in Maribor, who had been hired for all kinds of things, including espionage, bodyguarding and even assassination. This is one of the few places where the Cat Witchers are mentioned and it explains the general disdain of the Wolf School Witchers for the cats. When the men aboard the Prophet Libyoda talk about the elven woman who had lost her child, they tell Geralt that she had mourned in their own elven way, muttering sayings like in the Elder Speech, something ends, something begins. This saying is actually one of the more important phrases in the Witcher books and appears over and over again. Therefore, it was a very fitting title as the final quest in Witcher 3, something I appreciated very much. The Voidianoi attacking the boat here in this short story is another creature showing up in another short story in Witcher 1, however in a smaller, more human-sized form. This entire story with the boat and the fight of the Aguara is almost a little adventure inside the story. So much so that one of the recently released Witcher comic books actually is based on exactly this story. It's called Fox Children. And that's it for today. We'll conclude this story in the next part. As always, leave me your comments and questions down below. And if you like the series, leave me a like. Keep your heads down, folks. I'll see you on the next one.